Christine Ermetz. I'm the Executive Director at the Windsor Historical Society. And Jenny Horan is the Executive Director at WinTV. And Jenny's right in the back there, and she is the mastermind behind all of these programs. So we would just like to, we're, we're, we're floored. Although we expected that a lot of people would come, so we crammed as many seats as we could into this meeting room. So, Jenny and I want to welcome you to this special screening of Jenny's marvelous documentary, Dylan's Market, a look back. And I would like to acknowledge members of the Dylan family who are here today. You will see Diana Quater and Tim Dylan in the documentary, and both of them are going to share a couple of reminiscences that didn't make it into the documentary after the program. So, Dylan's, will you just stand up so that people know who you are? Because even if they. <laughs> now, I would also like to acknowledge Lou and Mike Rabbit. And those of you who come to our programs know that it's really just punchy cookies. But um, Lou and Mike felt we should have a little more than punchy cookies for today, since it was Dylan's Market. And so they contributed so that we could have better food. So they're not going to stand up, but they know that you appreciate it. Um, so before we get to the heart of the program, and I introduce Jenny, um, I would like to tell you about a few Windsor Historical Society programs coming up. Now next Thursday, April 12th, we have our Shad Derby Trivia Contest, and there will be lots of beer, so it's ages 21 and up, but it's a lot of fun. And you can come with a group of six, you can come as a solo person and we'll put you with a group, or you can come just to observe. So next Thursday um, is when this is going to happen. And then next Saturday at 2 p.m., we're going to have a group of retired employees from Combustion Engineering, and they're going to be reminiscing about their experiences there. And I don't know if any of you have noticed, but we have a whole show that's on the meeting room walls about Combustion Engineering, which was such a part of Windsor, starting in the 1960s and really going up uh, through very recent times. And then April 22nd, which is also Earth Day, we're going to be hosting a fascinating tour of Windsor Trees with Windsor Tree Warden Jim Gavoni. And we have a school bus, courtesy of Sterling Veets. And this is probably the last time we'll have one of Sterling's school buses because he's closing his business and he's moving to Florida. So, um, it's going to be the Sterling Veets and Jim Gavoni show, and you would be well advised to sign up in advance. <laughs> Because a school bus only holds what a school bus holds, so you can't just come and expect that we're going to somehow squeeze you in. And then the other program, and maybe the most important program of the month, is Saturday, April 28th, and it's our biennial house tour. It's one of our biggest fundraisers. We have six wonderful homes representing the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. Um, private homes, um, including our own Strong Howard House, they're open for public viewing. And then the Thursday before that, on the 25th, Christopher, Christopher Wigren, who is from the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation, is going to be doing a lecture, sort of a survey lecture, on domestic architecture in Connecticut through the centuries. So we do that because we want to kind of give people an idea about what they're going to be looking at. So on House for Day, they'll really kind of understand. So sign up for the house tour. We have tickets in the auditorium. Uh, we have, it's not an auditorium, we have tickets in the, in the entrance lobby. And we hope that everybody will come. And so, um, another project, I just want to back up and talk about WinTV. I've always been a great admirer of WinTV. They do wonderful work. They run an amazing program for kids where they teach them how to do video. And actually, um, because this is essentially a program that doesn't cost us anything, all of your uh, admission fees are going to be split between WinTV and Windsor Historical Society. So you're doing good for Windsor Historical Society, and you're doing good for WinTV. But 
Um, I have to go into the project it. that we have just started in conjunction with Win TV is an oral history project. Um, uh, we're calling it Windsor Stories. We'll probably come up with a catchier name. We would love to interview you if you have a history in Windsor and if you have stories to share. And we're also looking for interviewers. And so about six weeks ago, Wendy Beebe, and I don't know if Wendy's in the audience. Wendy, are you here? Wendy is not here. But Wendy set up an interview with Nan Carmen and Margie Carmen Degada. And Margie's here. Margie. Yes, Margie's right there. And it was just a delightful morning. Um, we had wanted to get Nan on tape for years, and we spent about two hours, if you can believe it. Um, and we're not done. I have to go back and interview John Carmen and Margie, who want to be interviewed together. But um, out of these two hours of interviews, Jenny pulled together a marvelous 10 minutes to show you before we air the Dylan program. And then the other thing that really happened, which is great, is that the Carmens generously allowed us to scan some of their many photographs. And so this kind of expands our collection, and they're now available so all of you can see them. Plus the Dylan, all of the Dylan photographs too. Um, we've got to scan them, and they're part of our collection now. So we do hope that after seeing this program, you'll be tempted. Um, maybe you don't want to talk, but maybe you know somebody who has wonderful stories to share. Maybe you're interested in interviewing. We have this nifty little tape recorder, and it's really easy to use. Um, Jenny and I are really, really excited about this program, but we need all of your help to make it actually work. So see me, see Jenny. See Michelle Tom, who's, uh, Michelle, raise your hand, because she's our archivist, and uh, she's our technical guru, which is why she's here today, because I am certainly not a technical guru, as those of you who know me well know. But um, we need some help. It's tons of fun, and we need to capture these stories now when we can. You don't have to be old, either. Maybe there's a wonderful young person who should be interviewed. So, yes. So at this point, we want to show you um, 10 minutes of uh, the interview that we had with Margie and Nan. So, turning it over to Jenny and Michelle. It's Gladys Lawson, and my father was John Christensen. My father's uh, father was Niels Christensen, mm -hmm. and he came over from Denmark. Well, the two brothers, the two brothers Anders and Niels, um, came together. They were both farmers, mm -hmm. and they had farmed side by side uh, down on the banks of the Connecticut River because it was noted for its wonderful soil. We lived on the last house on Wilson Avenue. But the houses on the, across the street went all the way down to the railroad tracks. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then over the railroad tracks were the farms. Talk about flooding. Father, my uncle's house was of course on the farm. They were across the tracks on the farm. Uh, they moved all their furniture to the second floor, except their baby grand piano. That, that had to stay in the flood. Mm. And um, oh, the, it, the, the, the water came up to the second floor. They, the, the first floor was flooded in that house. And it came all the way up Windsor Avenue, uh, Wilson Avenue, up to Windsor Avenue. And our house, that was right down there by the, the farm, uh, it came up to our first floor, mm -hmm. right up to the first floor. I met my husband, actually, um, 
He was a Windsor boy. His parents lived on Hayden Avenue. And, um, but I met him when he was a lifeguard at Lake Congamon. Oh. That's where I actually met him. We had our cottage up on the hill, and I'd walk down the hill and, and I saw him. <laughs> and I, I went back up. I was 11 years old and I went back up and I told my mother I just met the man I was going to marry. <laughs> How old was he at the time? He was 17. Oh, I, I went back up and I told my mother, I said, I just met the <laughs> man, I'm going to marry. She said, oh yeah. man, that's just puppy love. She said, that's, that's, uh, that'll never be it. I said, you wait and see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was in the service. And when he came home from the service, um, Merwin and Leek were, had been in business. They were funeral directors. They had been in business 50 years in Windsor. And uh, we thought, boy, it's gonna be tough to, they, they wanted Frank to come to work for them, but he, thought, no, they were, they, they were both up in their 60s, and he says, I'll have to, all I'll do is be working for them. I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, he refused that, and he thought, well, and then he said to me, what do you, what do you think? We, we'll start out on our own. I said, sure. So we looked, well, we got to find a place to start a funeral home. There got to be a good location. So um, we noticed that house on the corner of Pequodic Avenue and Prospect Street. And um, we thought it was for sale. But when we found out that Bill Hastings had a option to buy it. Well, Bill was a friend of my father's and um, he heard that we were looking at that property. So I could hear his voice see now and he said, well, if you kids want it, he says, I'll take off my option. You can buy it. <laughs> so that's how we got that building. That's yep. And we uh, uh, started our first funeral home. Now we have nine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll tell you, it was something bringing up four little kids on top of a funeral home <laughs> and keeping them quiet for calling hours and for the mm -hmm. <laughs> things that... Uh... There was one part of the funeral home that was up on our, uh, on our living space, and that was the casket display room. So, which was like off our back room and off our back bathroom. So, if my father had met with a family and they, he had to bring them upstairs and into the casket display room, if you got stuck in that back bathroom, <laughs> you had to wait it out <laughs> until the family had left and gone back downstairs. So you got stuck back there. But, um, you know, we had a big house. We had, you know, there were five bedrooms, you know, <laughs> and a huge family room that we ended up building on later and uh, looked out over the center of town. We had access to everything, you know. Mm -hmm. The movie theater was right around the corner. Of course, you know, we would walk to the theater, you'd give us money, and, you know, my brothers, you know, Ricky and Billy would be in front of me, and I had to walk ten steps back so they didn't know I was with them. Um, <laughs> but we'd go and bring our own bags of popcorn. <laughs> but there was Schweiger's uh, store next, right next door, which was like a candy store, and kind of a little convenient shop. I mean, you could go in there for sodas, but you could get bread or milk or things like that. And Mrs. Schweiger was there. Mm. And we'd buy all of our penny candy. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> always wanted a horse. That was my father had a love for horses. He had had a pony when he was young, and he even went to college at University of Alabama, and he had a extracurricular, I don't know, class, but he taught um, girls riding at, in yes. college. Ooh, this is a nice and um, so I just had that love for horses since I was a little girl. And again, he used to take me to Ponyland, became very good friends with the Mechachonises. Mm -hmm. And it was about when I was seven years old, and I think back now, who, who would do this? But <laughs> they would bring me up to Ponyland every single Saturday at about 8 o'clock in the morning. they dropped drop me off. I was there all day long. I mean, we groomed the ponies. I, you know, Jimmy and Tommy Mechachonis were, of course, much older than I was, and I was just a little pain in the neck to them. <laughs> but I helped them. I, we groom the ponies, get them ready for the ring, and I was there all day and work with the ponies. And then my parents would come back and pick me up. Talk about a hot babysitter. <laughs> How did you work that? That was great. <laughs> Then I remember when the shopping center was built. Oh, oh my gosh, Sage oh, Allen's yes. and Suburban Gal and all these, I mean, <laughs> miners' clothes. It was like, wow, Okay. Hartford has come to Windsor. You know, oh, you yes. didn't have to get on the bus. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we had great parades, mm -hmm. like Memorial Day parades were huge. Yeah. yeah, and all of them used to march in the parade, you know, in their uniforms. Mr. King, you know, right. and, and my dad, and, mm -hmm. and Jimmy a, Dillon. Over the years, I have gotten a lot of friends who have moved into Windsor, um, you know, when they got married or whatever, and we'd laugh because Windsor is pretty special mm -hmm. in that. You know, a lot of people, even in my generation, we are, my husband and I are very good friends. We have so many good friends that we grew up with in high school who married, and they all stayed in Windsor. Mm -hmm. Their kids are friends with my children. Mm -hmm. They now are married and having kids, and they're still friends. Windsor has gotten bigger, but it's still a pretty small town, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, which makes it so special. I have got books filled with letters that people write afterwards mm -hmm. thanking us for the help and mm -hmm. for the kindness and for understanding and mm -hmm. so on. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very gratifying. Mm -hmm. It really I'm sure. is. I'm sure. Even Especially though it's a hard thing to yeah, face, you know losing a loved one, but uh, people are just so appreciative of your kindness that it, it makes it all worthwhile. is here today, which I think is great. Do you, Rands, do you want to just raise your hands so that, there they are. Okay. And Jenny's Road to Win TV began at WTNH Channel 8 in New Haven. And while there, she wrote, produced, and directed local commercials and promotional programming. And then she went on to WDRC Radio, working as Commercial Continuity Director before opening her own web design firm. She's a graduate from Southern Connecticut State University with a degree in journalism, as well as Manchester Community College, where she studied web design. And I just think, 
um, that anyone that can do what she does, running a station and all of the graphics and the web stuff, um, we are so lucky to be partnering with somebody like Jenny on um, this oral history project. So she's going to tell you a little bit about how the Dylan um, program came to be. So Jenny, let's give her a hand. This program is Dylan. very much. That was a great introduction. <laughs> I don't, I'm not as great a public speaker as Christine is, but I'm, I'm so thrilled to see everyone here. I mean, this this is a testimony to Dylan's Market, not, not to us or the Historical Society, because what I knew would happen with this project is I knew that there would be people that had memories, that wanted to share them and wanted to go back and, and relive those days. Um, you know, the Historical Society of Wintiti, we have, uh, we have a similar mission in that we want to archive Windsor's history. And so I was excited when the opportunity for this program uh, became uh, a reality. I think it was about a year ago um, that we uh, connected with the Dillon family. And once the Dillon family was on board, it just took off because we could not have done this program without them, um, Diana and Tim and Tom, because they had incredible archives in their own house. That it was just it, it, like combine it with the historical society, and I was like, this could be a lot longer than we're even intending it to be. We did we did keep it to 30 minutes. Um, I was just telling somebody out in the hallway, I think we could almost do part two because we had to leave out quite a bit. Um, and that's why afterwards we're excited to have the Dillon children up here to share some stories that didn't make the cut, and they only didn't make the cut for time-wise, and they're incredible. Um, I have very special memories of, of Dillon's myself as a, as a young girl going in there with my mother, um, and I could just I could just see this program, you know, uh, laying out in my head, and um, and the Dillon's worked really closely on this, so I'm really proud of it. I feel they're really proud of it as well. Um, so, so again, afterwards we're gonna uh, have a little uh, sharing time, um, and if anybody in the audience is interested in sharing some memories, we'll pass the mic around um, because it really is all about um, community. And Dylan's Market um, was was definitely a big part of our community and a, and a big part of a lot of our childhood. Um, we do also have some DVDs if anybody's interested. We are we do have some here and. Um, see me afterwards. Um, but having said that, I think we're ready, Michelle, yes? All right, so just sit back and enjoy, and um, let's take a look. Dylan's Market, a look back. You know, it was a wooden floor, and it was a little saw. It was always a little sawdust on the, on the floor. I can remember that, and the aisles went straight down. Going over to, to Dylan's was where, you know, I mean, you could get a soda or something else, or you'd be getting something for your parents. And it was just a warm feeling. They knew you by name, and I can just remember as a little kid feeling that it was a warm, happy place. I think Dylan's Market was really special because of the way in which my grandfather and father approached the business. It was just, it was familiar, it was uh, pleasant, it was just friendly. And uh, I think uh, my father and grandfather really personified that. They, they were what the store was. My grandfather was, was born in Windsor. His uh, father, my great-grandfather, who was named John, he was actually uh, born uh, in Scotland. And part of the Irish, the great Irish immigration, there was a group that in America we called the Scotch-Irish which was a group of people who went from Ireland to Scotland and then very soon came to the, the United States. Yeah, I think he was probably 6'3", six, 6'4", six, something of that nature. So yes, he was a very distinguished gentleman, and he always acted that way. Uh, loved his cigars. Um, I can remember him sitting, uh, sitting in his chair where he always sat. Uh, in the evening and smoking his cigar. Um, he had one of those um, cigar trays. I guess it was like a pedestal kind of thing with a cigar tray up on the top and he would just twirl it there and listen to the Red Sox on the radio. 
Well, James Dillon started working uh, as a meat cutter around 1912, at least. Uh, he also was a clerk for Albert Lennox uh, in Albert Lennox's meat market. Um, they formed a partnership uh, somewhere around at least 1914, 1915. They had a, uh, a, a grocery called Dillon and Lennox, which was in... Um, the building, it was called the Ellsworth and Philly building. It was also called the bank building because the Windsor Trust was there. But um, uh, the Dillon's market really moved around a number of times. It seemed as though he was a little standoffish, but over the years, I've heard so many stories about how warm and funny and he was a practical joker and he was so kind to people. And I heard those stories uh, later in life. Um, and realized that I never really got to know my grandfather like I wish I had. But I would say about 1910, we have a knowledge of him working as a butcher, uh, and that was just prior to him owning the store. But he started uh, butchering, and uh, the person that he was working with thought he was so intelligent and so good at the job and so great with customers that eventually he became a partner. I'm the youngest of three children, so I'm the, uh, I didn't know my grandfather all that well. He died when I was quite young. But I do remember walking into the store and uh, walking in the big back step and seeing in the mirror. And at that, of course, he was very, uh, seemed to me to be ancient at the time. But uh, um, he was, even in uh, his later years, he was in the, the store going up and down the shelves with his feather duster, dusting off the cans and putting them back in. And I kind of watched that. I said, is that all he ever does? You know, you know, he was at the time, but you know, he'd had a lifetime of work behind him, so um, he deserved to just kind of walk up and down the aisles, talk to the people, and dust off the cans. He married Catherine Hayden of uh, Rainbow, and uh, they were married for 46 years. Definitely have memories of my grandmother growing up um, because she lived just uh, one house away from us, so we were down at her place quite a bit. Uh, and she was always at the stove, always cooking, because in those days, uh, my grandfather wanted to have a full meal uh, morning, noon, at night. So I remember her standing up at lunchtime, um, cooking those chops and making gravy. Uh, the thing you remember most about my grandmother is her devotion to her faith. Um, she was very, very religious, went to uh, church uh, literally every day of her life uh, to Mass. That's how my grandmother and grandfather met, uh, was through the church. In his obituary, they, they called my grandfather the Dean of the Windsor Businesses because he had been there so long and he had known everyone and he took part in so many things. He was uh, a director of what at the time was the Windsor Bank and Trust. And, uh, you know, you, you had your finger in your pie everywhere in those days as a small businessman. Uh, James Dillon Sr. was very active in town. He was he, the Windsor Fire Chief uh, starting in 1916. He was also a member of the uh, Fire District Commission, the town's Fire District Commission. He was a board member of the Windsor Trust, and uh, in 1939 he was elected to the town's Board of Finance. In 1953, he received the Outstanding Citizen Award from the Raymond B. McHugh's post of the VFW. Um, he was uh, Windsor's 1960 Chamber of Commerce senior member, um, and he was very active in St. Gabriel's Church, uh, serving on many committees there, as well as uh, being a trustee. In February of 1965, James J. Dillon Sr. died, and there was a letter to the editor uh, in the Hartford Times. It said, He was selfless, honest, and kind. The public was an integral part of his life, and he served it well. He was unbiased, fair, a keen student of human nature, a good judge of character, and he made no distinctions in regard to origin, race, or creed. My dad grew up on uh, Aquanic Avenue in a, in a small house over there, which is no longer there. It's um, uh, now where the parking lot of Jim's Restaurant is. I think it's still Jim's Restaurant. And then they moved over to Ridgewood. I think my father was expected to work in the business. Uh, it was just a, a natural progression from father to son. Uh, and 
I'm sure that he worked in the store when he was going to school, after school, he did the deliveries, he stocked, uh, and so it kind of became a natural thing. Uh, my father had two sisters, an older and a younger sister, and they weren't really involved in the store too much, uh, except of course that they shopped there. Um, but they did own uh, the building. My grandfather had made sure that uh, the, everyone in the family had a little bit of a cut of the store. And so they owned the building and my father owned the business part. Dad attended uh, what he always called the high school in uh, John Fitch, which was, uh, when I was a kid, was uh, elementary school and is now uh, apartments right on Bloomfield Avenue. He was quite a baseball player. <laughs> uh, I think he was a bit of a practical joker and probably was the class clown uh, in school as well. I don't know exactly when they met, but I know it was before the war. Uh, I know that he was with a bunch of his buddies and they were driving, I think, to West Hartford, where my mother uh, came from. Uh, they were driving in a car, a bunch of buddies having a good time, and I believe they were picking up one of their girlfriends, and my mother happened to be with them. And they all got in the car and pushed my mother towards my father, uh, and she didn't like him at first. <laughs> he was very full of himself and confident, she said. <laughs> And he was such a jokester, and she didn't get along with him at first, but that only lasted for about a date or two, and, and then they fell in love. We had started off uh, living above the store, and I don't really remember that, and if I lived there, it was like until I was one year old, then we moved to the uh, Ridgewood Road location where we lived. We, I actually lived up above the store on two different occasions, once as a child and then once as an adult when I first got married. Um, but when I was younger, you know, we had the whole upstairs, and it was a pretty big place. And it was very homey, and lived in the center of town, and as a kid, it was wonderful to live in the center because there were so many things to do. Uh, and it was easy to just go downstairs and, you know, get something to eat. And when we were a little bit older, my mother would send us down to pick stuff up at the store. Um, and so I got to see Dad working during the day, and I got to see my grandfather and all the people that worked in the store. We lived uh, on McQuantic Avenue, uh, which is where Jim's Pizza is now. Our house was there, and they demolished the house to put Jim's Pizza up. So it's interesting that there were five or six. So there's um, Smith & Burke, m and &E Market. If you go down Celio's at the corner of Loomis and McQuantic Avenue, had a little store there. And then uh, keep going down, and, and uh, Schweiger's, although it didn't have meat, it did have uh, dry goods, and it had an ice cream parlor which is where Jim's Pizza ended up going, the initial Jim's Pizza. And then um, we go to Dillon's, and then we go a little further down to Zizitsky's, uh, Aaron Zizitsky, which was in the Plaza Theater. In the old days, before World War II era, when you came in to buy your groceries, you'd walk into the counter, and there's two or three guys behind the counter, and you'd say, I'd like a can of corn. The clerk would go and get the corn, can of corn, bring it, put it back on the counter. You'd say, I want a can of beets. He'd go get the can of beets. It wasn't self-serve, which is what we have now, where you put your things in a cart. The, uh, the changeover to self-service uh, didn't happen until after my father returned from World War II. Uh, when he had been out in the West Coast um, during the war, he had, uh, that was the new thing out there, was the self-service grocery store. And he wrote to my grandfather about it. And uh, after war, when he brought my grandfather, brought my dad into the business, they decided to modernize and have a you know, self-service grocery store. So that's kind of where that came from. My father was really proud to be in the Marines. He volunteered uh, to serve in the war. Uh, he didn't talk a lot about his experience in the war. I don't think a lot of people in World War II uh, spoke of that. Um, he served in the Marshall I Islands. Uh, he went in as a Marine, grew through the um, ranks such as he could without being a, um, uh, a lieutenant or anything like that. He, I think staff sergeant was the, lar the highest level he could grow to, so he, he did that. I was very proud of his military service as well, he should be, um, but um, the only thing he would ever say is these are things that you don't want to know about that, you know, that happened over there. He did share one, one thing that I do remember is he, he said something about 
uh, one night um, sleeping in his bed. Um, and of course, there were bunks, you know, they're all through the whole area. And um, he said he had to get up to go to the bathroom in the, in the middle of the night. And while he was up, a grenade hit. And uh, I guess shrapnel and stuff came down and, and went through his bed. And he said if he had still been there, it would have been a lot different as what may have happened to him. And he said that that is why he, he marched every single uh, Memorial Day uh, in the parade. Uh, Memorial Day was very big for him. He said he owed it to all of the people that didn't come back. Uh, but my memories of him, of course, has always been in the Memorial Day parade. He was a master sergeant in the um, United States Marine Corps and uh, was in WW2 and was always, um, always at the parades. Him and a fellow by the name of Billy uh, Carter, who was in the Army. Both, you could definitely uh, count on them to be in all the parades, and they had walked all the time, too, so. He and my dad were like the parade organizers or, or marshals for the Memorial Day Parade every year. You know, there was a representative, my dad was in the Army, and Jim Dillon was in the, was in the Marine Corps. So, you know, and the two of them would make sure that the parade was all organized, everybody knew what they were going to do, and they just did that for years and years and years. Even the last few years of his life when he was blind, he still marched in the parade and raised the flag. And we think he might have the record for having marched in the Memorial Day Parade for the longest amount of time. But it was very important to him. From time to time, I'd on a Saturday or something, I'd go over and I'd bag groceries for my dad. And, you know, everyone is uh, making a big fuss about delivering groceries. And we did it back in, you know, <laughs> in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, as far back as I can remember, we were always part of the store. Um, I do remember going with my father to um, some of his stops. He would deliver, um, I think, meat mostly to some, so, like some of the manufacturing places in, around Windsor. My primary job uh, as I grew was to deliver the groceries. So this, you know, the deliveries, that wasn't a new thing. We did that way, 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 way back in the day, as they say. There was, being a small business, there was never more than 10 employees at the most there. Most of them were long-term. We had two of our employees, uh, two great guys. There was a, one was Lester Easton. Uh, Lester Easton worked, we, I happened to find his uh, um, obituary that we'd kept the other day. He'd worked for the store for 52 years. Um, and he actually almost died in the store. Um, I was standing next to him one, one day, standing behind the meat counter, and he was just standing there and he wasn't moving. And we kind of looked at him and we had to pull, pull, put him aside and, and sat him down for a while, and he'd had a stroke. And they took him to the hospital and he passed away after that. They knew everybody. They knew everybody that came in. They knew you by name. Um, as I say, I can remember the personalities, George Nickel, um, who used to kind of be in charge of the produce section, as I remember it. Um, he was just this just gentlemanly, very gentlemanly, small um, uh, man, but you know, with pure white hair and, and just such um, round cheeks, and he always smiled and you know, always treated the, you know, the children you know, like, they were, um, like they were special. You know, I can probably even gave us an apple or an orange or, 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 or something. Both of the father and son were there when I was young. Uh, but I remember going to the deli, and on the way to the deli, there were these bags along the side of the aisle. And in it were different sized rolls. There were grinder rolls and hard rolls. And, and on Sundays, I'd go in there and get cold cuts, and then pick up a different roll from different bags and put them in one, one bag and then and go out. You know, no matter where you were, it, Mr. Nickel would have a smile on his face. And uh, when you walked in the back, there were these big, two tall men with the white hats and, you know, like, uh, you know, obviously dressed in the uh, all in sanitary garb or whatever it was. But those were those were the butchers. Those were the men who who, you know, who would take the meat out and very carefully place it. But they would always talk to the, you know, talk to the kids. And, and you know, I can remember press, pressing your face against that glass in the in the counter and just looking at the, looking at those things, you know.
James Jr. was just as involved in civic affairs as his father. He was a member and officer of the Volunteer Fire Department, and he helped found the Windsor Volunteer Ambulance Company. Um, in the 1950s, he helped raise money to get the fire department its first ambulance. Um, and in 1979, he actually worked to make the ambulance company its own autonomous group. I, I can remember being in there and having the fire horn go off when the fire department was, was in the center of town off of Union Street um, where the police station was and having Jim Jr. run out because he was in the fire department as were so many of the businesses that were in town, in the center, because they were the only ones that get, had the manpower there during the day. And um, I'm sure probably to his father's um, dismay sometimes that he had to, had to leave. But, you know, those were the things that they did. Both my grandfather and father and then my brother as well were involved in uh, the fire department. They were volunteer firemen. Uh, my grandfather was a uh, fire chief for quite a few years. Uh, and my father, I think, was with the fire company, volunteer fire company, for about 25 years. And, uh, and dad was responsible uh, for raising funds and recognizing a need to have an ambulance in town. Uh, so he and um, Aaron Zizitsky uh, really started the whole volunteer ambulance. Uh, and they were ambulance drivers in every uh, every time they needed a new ambulance, they would raise more funds and they would actually go and pick the car up and bring it back um, and really started developing that, that whole uh, volunteer ambulance need uh, in town. The fire department was a big, big part of my father's life and it was also a big part of our lives because many of the activities that were sponsored and we got involved with had to do with the fire department. In 1958, he was uh, elected president of Windsor's Chamber of Commerce, and he actually received the Jerry Hallis Award uh, from the Windsor Chamber of Commerce in 1993. They were involved in the chamber um, by participating in events and understanding what the value of the chamber is and was at the time. Jim Dillon Jr. received the Hallis Award in 1993 for all his work in promoting small business. House Award is given to an individual who is a member of the Chamber of Commerce who not only uh, works for the Chamber of Commerce but does outside work within the town to better the town. We became very good friends through the Kiwanis Club. I mean, I, when I first came back and joined my father in the late 60s, um, 67, 68, um, I joined the Kiwanis Club, and, and Jim was there then. Well, of course, you know, all of a sudden now that cuts through all the ages, even though I was in my 20s. These men that were in their 40s and, and you know, late 40s and, and early 50s, well, now you were all club members together. Everybody in the family was really heartbroken when dad came home one day and said he had made the decision to close the store. Uh, it was the time when uh, a lot of the bigger chain stores were, were coming in and uh, the generation that came into his store had begun to die off. Uh, and it's, you know, life just moves forward and changes. During the time that it happened, we, we sold the property, or Dad sold the property in 76. During that era, you could see things were um, uh, beginning to change. Um, the, the, the store that the Geislers is in right now used to be First National. Um, that used to be a big store. Now it's called a small neighborhood store. And it was just kind of inevitable that things were going to peter out. I, you know, I talked to talked about Plaza Market, a little small store that went out of business. Smith and Burke went out of business. It was just, you could kind of see the writing on the wall. He always said, uh, you don't want to go into this. It's, it's, going to, it's only going to get harder. Don't ever do anything to do with retail because the, the hours uh, are going to increase and the pressure uh, is, is going to increase over the years. My dad had always told me that he had told his father that uh, he would never let him let the business go under. So, you know, he did, chose to end it on his terms. So it was a, it was a tough decision to make, um, but we had a big party in the end. <laughs> he invited all of his old customers to come back. 
it did affect all of us, of course, because it was, it wasn't just the store. It was uh, was our life, uh, you know, as a family for many years, and uh, it was you know constant parade in and out. Family, his uh, sisters came up. Uh, sister, uh, one of them lived in North Granby, the other lived out in West Hartford. They came back. Really, it had um, it had outlived its time. Uh, it was an old-fashioned business in a, a changing modern world, and it couldn't compete with margins on the, um, for the bigger stores. Um, and he, he'd rather see it, uh, you know, like I say, close the doors by, by himself than someone forcing him to. Uh, Dad, after he retired, he wasn't quite sure what he was going to do, um, but he fell into real estate. He wanted to do something where he would still have contact with people. Oh, that's right, I forgot. He was Grandpa Jim over at the Montessori School. Uh, he, um, I don't know how he got into it, but he went and volunteered. He was looking for something, uh, you know, in his odd hours, and uh, somehow he found uh, that they were looking to have somebody older come in and be with the, t the kids, and uh, they loved him. I mean, there were pictures of the kids just hanging off of him. You know, being privileged to, to handle his funeral arrangements when, when Jim Jr. died. But in the last few years, um, he was almost blind, and it was difficult for him to see, and yet he wanted to go to Kiwanis. And, and usually one of his, his children would bring him to the Windsor House or wherever we were meeting and everything, and I can remember bringing him home on several on several occasions because he was always and as stubborn as he was I I'd offer to help him to the door and no no once I'm on my on my driveway I know my way and I and he could do it even though he couldn't couldn't see but even though here he was blind and 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 having a great deal of difficulty getting around he wanted to go to those those club meetings and had input <laughs> and and had input and would uh, and would uh, certainly tell you if you were making a mistake or there was something that could have been done better yep and uh, but he was there he was there and so that's again kind of special because that makes that that whole circle as I think about it which I didn't then but seeing that tall man with the the white cap behind the butcher counter when you're a little kid and then that same man who is now, you know, stooped and, and frail. And you're able to bring him home from a, a meeting that he, he wanted very much to, to uh, participate in. So uh, that was, uh, that's really a privilege for me. Oh, there's no doubt about it. It was the, uh, the um way we reacted with uh, the customers, the customer service and being part of it. Everybody was welcome, everybody was appreciated. We spoke to everybody. We didn't, we didn't just let them walk around and buy the groceries, check them out and say goodbye. Um, you know, we always talked with them, interacted with them, knew their families, uh, they knew ours, and uh, that was a big part of it. I was the third generation. My brother and I were the third generation in that store. We had customers who were third generation. Myself and, and my younger brother Tim and my older brother Tom uh, got together and made a plaque for him and presented him with a plaque thanking him for being who he was basically, uh, for being such a great example in life, for having such a great sense of humor and, and including us in, in the joy that was Dylan's Market uh, and for being our dad. But, you know, the fun things were to go, to go across the street to where the stores were. Um, you know, we used to take and, um, and get the uh, refrigerator boxes from Kings and take them and make forts out of them and everything. But then, of course, we would go to uh, Mrs. Swigers had the uh, penny candy store that was just, uh, just down the street on, on Pequannock Avenue. We had a little tiny grocery cart. Um, just a wire grocery cart, child size. Uh, a little kid could stand up there and put their hand on it and push it around. And every girl and every boy who came in went right over to that grocery cart because it was their size. And even if they never put anything in it, they'd push that thing up and down the aisles 
and you know many times they'd they'd follow their mother along and the mother would put you know a can of corn or something in the things for them and they'd go down the end of the aisle and they'd turn around and come back the other way and dad would always say oh you found the cart yeah they did so they were always thrilled with that cart <laughs> Um, there's a story of him, as a matter of fact, um, being in town, and uh, there was a, a policeman who had a police cruiser, and he would always park it and leave the police cruiser running in it. I guess he used to drive my father crazy when he was a teenager. Uh, and one time it was parked with the, the motor running, and my father got in the car and moved it and parked it a few blocks away and left it there. <laughs> And of course, they suspected that it was him. <laughs> However, I don't think they ever caught him. <laughs> so he would do little things like that. So he was a bit of an imp. <laughs> So at this point, I'd like to invite Diana and Tim to come up, and uh, Jenny too, and uh, start with the reminiscences. Okay, Diana's first. Oh, I'm first? Yeah, I got first. I'm not, okay, so I have to hold the mic. No, no, I'm good. Um, talking about the customer service, it kind of reminded me of a couple of stories of, of my father always trying to keep his customers happy. And usually everything was nice and light in the store, but he had a customer who came in all the time, a woman who was uh, well off, uh, always paid her bills, very nice woman. But every day she came in, she opened a carton of eggs, and she would take an egg out, and she'd stick it in her pocket. <laughs> she had a big coat pocket, and she'd stick it in her pocket. And my father tried to figure out how could he get her to stop doing that without insulting her, making her feel bad. <laughs> so um, he finally came up with a solution, and he... Uh, she was in one day and she put the egg in her pocket and my father came over to her and said, you know, you are the best customer we have ever had. And squished the egg and broke it in her pocket. She never stole an egg again. And there was another, uh, another customer who happened to be um, one of his best friend's wives. <laughs> wives. And she used to come into the store. She was a very outgoing, lovely person. Uh, but strawberry season used to get her. And she would come over and she'd be looking at the strawberries. <laughs> and she would take one out of a, a pint and she would eat the strawberry. And she would take another one out of another pint, eat the strawberry. <laughs> another one, eat the strawberry, you know, checking to make sure nobody was looking at her. <laughs> and, uh, and then she'd take a whole bunch of strawberries and put them on top of the box so she had lots of strawberries. And so my father would always watch for it and he would check her out. <laughs> so he's up at the cash register and she comes with a big overflowing box of strawberries. And he's, he rings it up and pushes it through uh, on the counter, and he says to her, oh my heavens, is that Father Daly out there? And she would turn around, and he would, while she was looking, he'd grab a strawberry and throw it in his mouth and chew it. And then she'd turn back and she'd look at him, <laughs> and he'd be chewing with, you know, <laughs> juice running down. But what could she say? Because she stole all the strawberries. And then, you know, so she'd be saying, and he'd say again, oh, look, it isn't that so-and-so across the street? The same thing. <laughs> he would go and take another strawberry and throw it in his mouth and be chewing it. So she stopped stealing strawberries. <laughs> so that's how he kept his customers happy. He would 
not embarrass them, but he would kind of let them know somehow that they weren't doing the right thing. <laughs> Those are my funny stories. <laughs> How about you? You got something? I got one. That's close. Right. <laughs> this thing can work, yes. I just have the one story. We talked about uh, del uh, the delivering groceries in those days, and uh, I actually brought one of our old delivery boxes. This is from like the 1930s, 1920s, and it actually folds. It folds. It's, a, it's called a Star Folding Delivery Box, and it's got our name it's on the side of it. And this was used when uh, that picture right Sam standing next to was uh, uh, we were delivering groceries in that old wagon. And that there is Lester Easton as a young man, the guy who worked for us for 50 years. The reason I bring up the delivery stories is uh, we have uh, uh, a story in the family. We call it the ironing board story. And it has to do with uh, delivering groceries. And in the days I delivered groceries as well. And in those days, uh, as most of you remember, no one locked your door. And we deliver groceries, of course you always go to the back door. That's the tradesman's entrance. But we go out, we'd knock on the door, we'd wait a second, and if no one came to the door or said anything, we tell you open the door. And you go in, you say, Dylan's a market, and you come in, you put away the groceries. You bring them in, and you stick the, stick the milk in the refrigerator, ice cream would go in the freezer. That's what we did. And even my grand, my dad, as a young man, did the same thing, delivering groceries. And one day he was delivering, or I had delivered to a woman in Deerfield. I won't tell you her name and uh, where she exactly where she lived, but it was in the Deerfield section of town. And I had come back, and my dad said, "Come here, I want to tell you a story." And it's, I was, you know, 16, 17 years old, and you know, dad's beginning to tell you those adult stories. And he says, "I used to deliver groceries to this woman." And just like in our day, you know, he walked up to the door and uh, knocked on the door, heard nothing, and he opened the door and he heard the radio on. And so, you know, okay, someone's home, somebody opened the door, walked in, said Dylan's Market, walked in into the kitchen, and through the doorway in the next room is the woman ironing stark naked. <laughs> Absolutely stark naked. She, we had, she had the radio on so she didn't hear him. And she, the poor woman got so flustered, she tried to run out of the room, tripped over the iron, knocked over the ironing board, and got so tangled up, my dad had to go over and help her get up off the floor. <laughs> and uh, so that's the ironing board story, one of the family favorites. So, but uh, yeah, there is, those things don't happen anymore, you know? <laughs> But I don't really mean to, uh, wanted to, to uh, for the family, we want to take, thank Jenny for doing such a wonderful job on this thing. And, uh, that is a real professional quality, let me tell you. And also, I don't, don't mean to steal your thunder here, but in many of the pictures you saw, my dad standi standing next to Aaron Zizisky, which is his best friend for many, many years, owned the Plaza Market. Aaron's daughters are here today. Hi, yeah, I thought you were going to get away with it, right? <laughs> Lynn and Sharon are back here, and uh, they're going to be working on some more stuff for, uh, regarding the Plaza Market as well. So, any more stories you have, they talked about this for the, the oral history of Windsor. Um, if we don't do it, these all these stories are going to be lost. What's up? Oh yeah, I forgot to say. Thank you. We, we almost wanted to mention this before I hand the microphone over to Jenny. Um, my uh, aunt here, Jenny. Ginny Dylan Emerson, who was uh, um, my dad's younger sister. She managed to come here today and uh, see the thing as well. And I hope you enjoyed the program, right? Good? Okay. Good. So, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Ginny. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. I, I wanted to know if there's anybody in the, in the audience who uh, had any stories they wanted to share. We'd love to hear. <laughs> hand you the mic, Margie. <laughs> I am Margie Carmen Degada, and like it was said before, <clears throat> I lived in the center of town, and of course the funeral home was right over there around the corner. And when I was young, we used to have this very overweight um, uh, uh, beagle. And back in those days, the dogs would just roam free. You didn't tie them up, you didn't take them for walks, you just let them go. And Bonnie used to 
walk across the street, and she would go to the back of Dylan's and scratch at the door, and Mr. Dylan used to come out, see Bonnie, hand her a bone, and off she'd go. <laughs> so yeah, he, they, that Dylan's definitely fed many members of the community. Anyone else want to share? Yeah, Dylan's been around back there. I'm going to hand back to you. Keep going, hand it back. I'm Jean Liscord Kelly. I grew up on Ridgewood Road and was a neighbor of the Dillons. Um, my grandmother uh, became a widow early after she moved it into the house on Ridgewood Road. And um, she said Jim, well it would have been Jim Jr. then, that um, would deliver groceries to her because she, she didn't see very well either. So uh, we were the recipients of that many, many years ago and continued to trade there till I was, you know, uh, through my years. And I remember my mother sending us over there frequently and we'd always say, charge to this court. <laughs> Never had, but back then they would take, they would charge, you could charge it and then pay the bill at the end of the month, which was very special. I loved Lester Easton, who used to come to our back door and come right in and deliver groceries. I'm Evelyn Smith, and I lived in 17 Ridgewood Road for 100 years, and uh, really loved the Dillon's Market. During the war, and as uh, some of the students at Loom State said, which war? But anyway, during the war, I, they stopped delivering groceries. And so my mom would call up and get the order, and I could remember the telephone number was 206. She'd call in the grocery order, and I would go over. My dad built a, a box to put on a wagon that I hitched to the back of my bike, and I rode over and got the, book, got the groceries every Saturday morning. My mother never had to learn about red, red stamps and blue stamps and all that. And Mrs. Evelyn, as some of you may remember her, lived at the corner of Ridgewood. One day she discovered that I did this every Saturday, and she said, uh, would you ever get my groceries for me? And I said, sure, yeah, I'd love to. Okay, and she gave me five dollars. Well, I thought I was rich. I couldn't figure out why my parents hadn't paid me, but they reminded me that I ate the food that was in there. <laughs> I'm uh, Carol Snellgrove McCumber, and I remember fondly Dylan, especially with my grandfather. Um, he retired when I was born, so he was my babysitter for many, many years and my best friend. And every morning we would make the rounds, uh, Patterson's. I love that place, it was huge as a kid. Um, then the post office, and we'd visit his brother at the florist, and then we'd go to the bank, and he'd sit me up on the, the shelf, you know, with the bars, and I'd look over at the money and everything, and then we would end up at Dylan's. My mom would give him um, her list for shopping, and I do remember the little cart and how I wanted to walk that home. <laughs> One winter night, my mother was at Southwest School because she was teaching, and it was parents' night. So she was there, I was with my grandparents being babysat, and there was a knock at the door, which after dark was a horrendous thing, it was always trouble. So my grandparents, who barely spoke English, cracked the door open, and there stood my father with his hand wrapped in bloody white towels. And he said, the person with him that I learned afterward must have been one of the Dillons, drove him there to tell them that he would take him to the hospital. And, and he swore when it jammed that he shut that machine off. He just didn't pull the plug. And so he reached his hand in and pulled that piece of meat loose and the grinder took off and there went the finger. And so he was back to work probably within about 10 days. And he was standing behind the counter. I went in with my mother who was probably six or seven months pregnant at the time and couldn't stand to look at the hand. Um, and he'd stand behind the counter and he'd say to people as they came up, does anybody want some fresh ground chuck? <laughs> <laughs> And that's my dad. 
Dylan, sir. <laughs> My name is Hank Hallis, I'm Sherry Hallis' son. Um, this morning I went and looked in our old newspapers and I found that uh, Dillon's was a, com was a community spirited operation. It's the first grocery store I ever went to as a kid and, and went there all my whole life. But uh, I have a copy of the first advertisement and of course, starting a newspaper in town was a big deal at that time, 1944. And I've got a copy of the first advertisement from Dylan. And what was also interesting was December of that year, 1944, Sergeant uh, Dylan returned. It was front, front page uh, news. So that, that's for the Dylan family. Before I hand it back over to Christine, um, my, my story actually is the one that, that Tim told. Um, I, I uh, purposely put that in there because that's really my, my best memory of, um, of the shopping cart and going right in and going for that shopping cart and I, you know, it was only two aisles but I used to feel like so grown up just going up and down those aisles and, um, and remembering um, Mr. Dillon um, walking us outside, loading the groceries in our car. He usually would carry me, and my mother would have to push the groceries and load them in because he loved children, and he would always be picking up the kids, you know, that came in. So that was that was my story. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Christine because I believe there's one more thing. Well, actually, there are two more things. Colette has a reminiscence too. Colette Poirier Brown. Poirier Brown. <laughs> and I do, I do so remember your dad. I have a, a vivid image of him. Although I have to say that we, as children, did not go into many grocery stores because my mother's grocery store was at the end of the phone. She, she just did her grocery shopping through the phone and had her her groceries delivered. So Aaron Sizitsky was her. Her grocer until he went out of business, and then it was Dillon's and, and Pequannock Central Market. But um, one of the things that my mother always did was she never knew poundage, so she'd say, "I'd like a roast for ten people." And whoever whoever your your the meat department was, they knew exactly what she wanted, how much to, how much to bring her. And I'm also relieved that none of those stories were about my mother. <laughs> Okay, folks, thank you for a wonderful afternoon, but you can't leave yet because there is another reminiscence, but it's got to be brought to us from the outside. So we're going to clear the center aisle, and the person who is providing the reminiscence doesn't want me to say anything more. So it's a mystery. Um, if you want uh, to have some refreshments, um, it's going to happen soon, very soon, within a minute. But uh, I can't, I, I'm sworn to secrecy, and I don't even know what I'm sworn to secrecy about. So, Christine? Well, I think we need to move it Having this party, so 
I guess uh, I can help out here. There's some uh, some gourmet delights here that you can pass around. And there's, uh, oh, I forgot to open the bags. Not that messed it all up. <laughs> and uh, we also have some uh, cookies that came in the original. Uh, uh, Pass these around, chocolate chip cookies. Right? Now, I don't know how many folks knew. Anyone here know, know Archie Easton? Yes. Know his name, yeah. Yes, he, uh, he told me quite a few stories about his deliveries around town, and uh, he uh, later, in the 50s, worked uh, at Taylor and Ben. I worked at Taylor and Ben. So, there's, uh, this is the groceries that would be delivered. Here's the grocery list that came. She called it in. <laughs> Oh, you have another one. 